Hi, this is a revision video for GCSE English Literature. We're looking at Animal Farm by George Orwell and this video gives an overview of the final chapter, chapter 10. By overview, I mean a summary of events, a look at key characters and some analysis of important quotations. If you just need an overview of the chapter, I cover that first. So let's move over here to give a summary of events. Now, in this chapter, years have passed. This chapter takes place many years after the rebellion. We're told of several key characters who have since died. The farm is more prosperous and better organised. The windmill has been completed and another is being built. The animals are still hungry, conditions are no better. The animals are still proud of Animal Farm. The pigs start walking on their hind legs and they also start to carry whips. The commandments are replaced with a single commandment and at the end of this chapter the pigs are indistinguishable from the men. Let's look at this chapter in more detail over here. Now we're told early on in chapter 10 that most of the old names that we've come to know in the previous nine chapters are now dead. We're told Muriel was dead, Bluebell, Jesse and Pincher were dead, Jones too was dead. We're told that he had died in an inebriate's home in another part of the country. Snowball was forgotten, Boxer was forgotten, except by the few who had known him. I'll just put a note here, an inebriate is somebody who is, drinks too much, it's a home for drunks. The pigs continue to sound unappealing and we can tell from Orwell's description that they have continued to be overindulgent and overfed themselves. Napoleon was now a mature boar of 24 stone and Squealer was so fat that he could with difficulty see out of his eyes. Orwell brings all points from the early part of the novel full circle here. The horses, old and new, still cannot read the alphabet and Benjamin continues to be much the same as ever. We learn too that the farm is much more prosperous and efficient. They have a threshing machine and a hay elevator, but it is immediately evident to the reader that none of this progress or none of the benefits of this progress have been passed on to the animals. The windmill, which was originally built so it would light the stalls and warm them in winter and would also run a circular saw, a chaff cutter, a mangle slicer and an electric milking machine, now is just used for milling corn and bought in a handsome money profit. In fact, Napoleon tells the animals that such luxuries are contrary to the spirit of animalism. The truest happiness, he said, lay in working hard and living frugally. I'll just put a note up here that to be frugal means not to spend a lot and not to consume a lot. Napoleon is telling them that they should work hard and live a simple life without consuming much in order to be happy. Orwell's irony is clear here. First, this is not against the spirit of animalism, for animalism was grounded in the idea that animals should no longer be slaves to men. And secondly, we know that the pigs do not live a frugal life themselves, quite the opposite. Now that we've reached chapter 10, it's worth returning to chapter 1 in our analysis to make comparisons, and it seems apt to remind ourselves here of Old Major's speech. Now, as I'm reading this, I want you to think of the pigs and decide whether they are truly adhering to the spirit of animalism. So here are some of Old Major's words from his speech in chapter 1. Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plough. He cannot run fast enough to catch rabbits. Yet he is lord of all the animals. He sets them to work. He gives back to them the bare minimum that will prevent them from starving, and the rest he keeps for himself. Now, in chapter 10, we can see that Orwell states, Neither pigs nor dogs produced any food by their own labour, and there were very many of them, and their appetites were always good. So we can see Orwell's commentary on power and how the principles of animalism, or maybe socialism, are easily subverted by those hungry for power, wealth and status. There is a flash of positivity in this chapter, a seeming glimmer in the gloom. We're told that the animals never gave up hope. There's a sense of pride among them that they were still the only farm in the whole county, in all England, owned and operated by animals. We also learn that when they heard the gun booming and saw the green flag fluttering at the masthead, their hearts swelled with imperishable pride. 
and then we're told that the dream of animalism hasn't been abandoned and that someday it was coming. Now it's important that we pause here to think about this. They feel pride in their farm, despite the fact that they're cold, hungry, overworked and under the constant threat of terror from the pigs. This is no way to live or to work, yet Orwell portrays them as clinging on to this misty dream. It's helpful to remember that we were told that the rebellion had been successfully carried through in chapter two, yet now they're dreaming of better times. Perhaps there is a message here about how people under some regimes will cling to an ideal while they're living in desperate poverty. There's a strong sense in the narrative that the animals are trying to convince themselves that the suffering is worth it. Worth it. If they went hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. But as readers, we can understand from this quotation that this can't possibly make have made it any easier. Not because it's comforting to work for a cause you believe in, it, it can be, but because we know that it's simply not true. If you replace the phrase human beings in that quotation with pigs, and then you consider that they don't really work for themselves, we know that the products of their labour is sold to human customers, then the animal's outright denial here is clear. This is then reinforced with the lines, no creature among them went upon two legs. No creature among them went upon two legs. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. And it is at this point that Orwell really starts to tighten up the irony for immediately after this, the sheep are taken away to learn a new song when there is a sound of a terrified neighing of a horse and this turns out to be Clover, who has seen, this is a quotation, a pig walking on his hind legs. Now this turns out to be Squealer and Napoleon follows in a similar fashion and he carried a whip in his trotter. Once more the animals huddle together in fear. The sheep of course have learnt a new bleating chant to support this new development and four legs good, two legs better is bleated for five minutes without stopping. Of course, this rewriting of the maxim, four legs good, two legs bad, which was meant to summarise or epitomise even the spirit of everything that they'd been fighting for, this rewriting is really the marker that everything they fought for is now lost. Or perhaps not everything, because somehow things get even worse in this chapter. Now, once again, Benjamin agrees to read and we learn that all of the commandments have been removed from the wall to be replaced with all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Now, this quotation here doesn't even really make sense. We do not get gradations of equality. You're either equal or you're not. So here we can see the rewriting of the commandment down to this one simple line has been done in such a way that it means the pigs can now get away with anything, which is exactly what they do. That evening, the pigs receive human visitors to the farm. And if you were in any doubt as to whether things have come full circle and whether the animals live in constant fear, we learn that as the humans arrived, they worked diligently, hardly raising their faces from the ground and not knowing whether to be more frightened of the pigs or of the human visitors. Now, this congregation of the pigs and the humans can be linked to the Tehran Conference of 1943, in which the Soviet Union, Britain and the United States claim to be allies. As the evening progresses, the animals peer through the window as the pigs and the humans drink together. The alcohol is flowing and Pilkington stands up to give a speech on how inspired he is by what he's seen on Animal Farm. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals on Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animals in the county. And then later he makes this crucial comparison. And when I say crucial, I'm referring to our understanding as readers. If you have your lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. So the circle is now complete. The poor treatment of the working classes at the hands of the elite has been acknowledged to exist on the farm. The sentiment of equality has truly died. Napoleon stands up to speak and declares that they will no longer be calling each other comrade. This was one of the markers of equality between the animals and then he announces that the farm will be known as Manor Farm once more. 
as an argument breaks out between Pilkington and Napoleon, just as the Cold War started shortly after the Tehran Conference, and the animals continue to look on, we're told that the creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which. And so the novel ends. Everything has returned to the state that it was at the start. The animals live in hunger and poverty under the regime of terror and the whip. The opportunity for power and wealth was seized by the pigs at the expense of the other animals. And perhaps it's fair to say that the betrayal of their own kind makes the position on Manor Farm even worse by chapter 10 than it was under Jones. We're going to leave it there. It's been a pleasure making these videos for you. Please subscribe as I will continue to update this area with other short videos on themes, characters, character studies and other contextual bits. But until then, thanks for watching and goodbye.